Good afternoon, everybody. This discussion today is uh, manufacturing misappropriation. Does China's manufacturing prowess and intellectual property violations? On behalf of the Richmond Center, Joint Venture of Columbia Law School and Business School, thank you for joining us today. I'm Jesse Green, a senior fellow at the Richmond Center. The Richmond Center promotes evidence-based public policy and fosters dialogue and debate on emerging policy questions where business and markets intersect with the law. Certainly today's topic <coughs> involves both business and the law in complex and important ways, as our speakers will demonstrate. The topic of the day has been with us for some time. It is a continuing concern of companies doing business in China and for those facing competition from China. American companies see tremendous opportunity for growth from emerging economies in general, but especially from the already large and what will be eventually be the leading economy in the world. At the same time, they see big risks. Today, we will discuss what China's manufacturing process is and explore the impact on intellectual property rights. Then, where is China's process heading, and what, if anything, can and should be done about it to protect property rights that provide the foundation for substantial economic return for many companies and their investors? I am pleased to have two leading experts in these matters with us today. Li Shi is professor of management practice at Harvard Business School. He has spent 18 years in the computer industry and 10 years in the consumer, in consumer electronics. He has two SB degrees from MIT and a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He is on the board of directors of Flextronics International and he chairs the technical advisory board for QD Vision of Watertown, Massachusetts. Will and I have known each other for many years. We work together in the consumer field in the past and recently have both been working with a major industrial firm that has significant business in China. Also with us today, and I'm pleased to have uh, with us, is Tim Wu, Isidore and Seville Sulzbacher, Professor of Law for Columbia Law School. His fields are internet, media, and communications. He teaches copyright, communications, or communications law and policy. He's a graduate of McGill University with a Bachelor of Science degree and holds a JD from Harvard Law School. He is clerk for Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit and Justice Stephen Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. He has also been Director of Technical Marketing at Riverstone Networks, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Virginia, Chairman of Free Press, and most recently Senior Advisor to the Federal Trade Commission. He has also been visiting professor at a number of major law schools and has published in the area of internet and information industries. His most recent book is The Master of Switch, The Rise and Fall of Information Empires. And the World Economic Forum recently named him one of their young global leaders of 2012. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining, for joining us today. Welcome to joining us today. Let me uh, kick this off with uh, asking Willie Shi to take us through, get us started with a discussion of China's manufacturing process. How has it developed to the efficiency and reliability levels that we have heard so much about? And why have they relied so much on technology created by others? Willie, would you help us with that? Thank you, Jesse. And uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start by telling you some stories. You know, the uh, first thing is I was, uh, I'm, I've been trying to write, uh, do some research on another industrial company that Jesse's not related to. Uh, this is an aerospace company, and uh, uh, they have a joint venture in China. And uh, so I finally, after two years, got in to talk to the head of the joint venture, actually after a year and a half. And uh, he said, you know, uh, this is on the fourth floor of a building outside Shanghai aerospace venture, and uh, he said, you know, uh, we like to hold a lot of our meetings in the park, right? It's like when we want to talk about something, we'll go to the, uh, the park or we'll go somewhere new, we'll walk around. And he actually said, 
And there are some meetings we won't even hold in the country. Uh, like if you, want, if you really want to talk about that, we're going to make everybody fly to Tokyo or Seoul. It's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, it turns out that uh, the Chinese have focused on commercial aircraft engines as something they really need to learn how to make. Right? So this joint venture is on the fourth floor. So then we get in the elevator, and we're going to you know, ride down to the ground. Elevator stops at the third floor. And it's their erstwhile joint venture partner, their commercial engine unit, right, which is on the floor below. Not part of the joint venture, but competing with them. Second floor, same thing. First floor, same thing. It's like, oh, OK, that's kind of an interesting data point. All right, uh, next data point was uh, I'm in Beijing, and you know, I'm wandering around. And there used to be this great place called the Silk Market. This is before they moved them into this big building and raised the rents, right? But it was right outside the US Embassy. Anybody ever been there? Great place. Yeah, yeah. What do you go buy there, right? You go buy, uh, well, you could buy anything you want, right? I would go buy, you know, knockoff Rolexes for $8, right? I, I found this one booth that I could get a good deal on, you know, the nice ones for 8 bucks. Don't laugh. I traded one in on a car once, okay? Uh, and so one of my colleagues there said, uh, yeah, Chinese people with money, they go to Hong Kong, or better yet, they go to Paris, they want to buy the real thing, right? Now, so j just put those comments out there for a moment. And now what I want to do is I want to tell you a story, because the story is really about how I developed a very different perspective on what's going on here, which I think has given me some uh, insights on that. And the story goes something like this. In the summers of 2008 and 2009, uh, being at Harvard, they give me a research budget. It's like, okay, I'm going to go try to understand some of these questions that I've always wondered about. So what we did is we hired three uh, freshmen at Harvard University, right? So these guys are like 18, 19 years old. And the requirement was you had to have been born in China and raised in China at least the first 10 years of your life, okay? And you have to be willing to work in a factory in China with us for the summer for free. We're not even going to pay you. You'd be amazed how many, we, we actually got 40 people who wanted to do this. So we picked three of them. We did, we, Harvard made me pay them a stipend, and it was good. I paid them a stipend. We paid their travel. They got to go home, all this stuff. Okay, so this was one of them, Jay Ling Hao. And uh, so we took them to this factory in southern China that makes mobile phones. Actually, they make, at the time, they were making a half million mobile phones a day. All right, so half million mobile phones. You could fill this room with mobile phones, and that'd be about a half million mobile phones per day, right? So uh, we bring them in through the job fair. Uh, uh, they get trained. They get two days of training. They put them on the assembly line, and uh, her job was to screw this little metal can on top of the RF section of the mobile phone. Others, some of her colleagues had jobs of put these four screws in 2,400 times a day. It's like, why would anybody in their right mind do something like this? But we really wanted to understand this, right? Now, we have a case and videos on this and all that, but one of the other things that happened as a consequence of this is three days into this, I said, you know, because uh, what would happen, this is all undercover, but three days into this, I, uh, they would come down on breaks and tell us what was going on. And I said, you know, this is just like the United States Western Electra, Hawthorne, Illinois, everything I've read about it in 1925, right? Frederick Taylor, scientific management. I'm going to break down these complex tasks. I mean, building a mobile phone is actually fairly complicated, right? But what they do is break down all these complex tasks. I'm going to give uh, people, you know, a small piece, time studies, do all this stuff. I said, this is just like what the U.S. looked like in 1925 from what I could gather. Then what we did is we went and uh, visited sister factory to this one that made essentially the same things. More interesting than that, they reported to the same managers, right? This is a global multinational that owned this company, but it was in Mexico instead of in China, right? So we go to Mexico, and it's like, from everything I've read, this is what the U.S. was like in 1970, right? Now, you could extrapolate, but what it did is it gave me this perspective that, you know, it may be... You know, most of the discussion you hear about uh, trade and globalization is all kind of macroeconomic and policy stuff. And we said, let's take the standpoint of looking at it from a developmental economic standpoint. So 
Then the next question, which I'd always wondered about, was how did the Chinese motorcycle industry get started? Okay, and uh, so having this wonderful research budget from Harvard, it's like, well, let's go look at this, right? And I knew the Chinese motorcycle industry got started in Chongqing. It turns out there are these things called coordinate measuring machines. Anybody know what they are? Right, they're, they're these little probes you'll see on this machine where you can make really nice copies of stuff. Okay, this is when I got the perspective that CAD CAM was the best thing that ever happened to counterfeiting, right? So all those things that you buy in the silk market, like knockoff watches. Okay, so anyways, it turns out we did this study on this uh, motorcycle maker's uh, Zongshan Industrial Group, Mr. Zhu Zongshan, his first engine, you know, back in the uh, end of the Cold War, the uh, state says, okay, Cold War is over, all you guys go make uh, consumer goods. So the party decides we're going to make motorcycles, okay, and what they do is they set up hundreds of companies, each of whom makes one part of the motorcycle. Okay, so Mr. Zoa's first engine, you'll notice he would buy the engine block from one company, the cylinder head from another, the pistons from somebody else, the connecting rods from somebody else. He would go to about 300 to 400 companies running around buying different parts. You can see that these things are made out of slightly different alloys. All right, so therefore, what happened is when the engine expanded, it didn't work so well after it heated up. Right? But he said, oh, well, there's so much demand for engines that we could you know, make these. And there was no R&D cost. I said, well, how did you know which parts to buy? He said, oh, we had standards. There was the Honda standard, the Yamaha standard, and the Suzuki standard. Right, so th these were all counterfeit parts, and you ended up with a thousand companies who sprung up assembling motorcycles. By the way, the same thing has happened in mobile phones. That wave has kind of passed now. But, you know, you had all these things, and now if you look at uh, uh, Zongshan Group, they have this whole line of motorcycles. They've actually moved into uh, outdoor power equipment. So I was looking at their showroom, and their outdoor power equipment, the second generator up, that looks just like the Honda generator that I bought. You know, I live in New Hampshire, so I need a generator. And then if you go to Home Depot and you buy one of these MTD yard machines, that's what these are, right? This is who makes them, right? So it's, it's kind of interesting. So what's, what's going on there, right? Is, is reverse engineering illegal? Well, the first thing you go back and say, you know, is it illegal? Actually, if you re research it, there's a long history of this as an accepted practice as a way to acquire know-how through disassembly, measurement, and so on. What is illegal is if you copy things that are patents, patented, right? Because patented goods uh, give the own owner of the patent the right to exclude. Okay, so, uh, so if you then go back and look at the histories of a lot of economies, uh, you know, I would argue that a lot of what is going on in China today actually happened in Taiwan and Korea in the 80s and 90s. I have a friend at tech, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation who is the largest semiconductor foundry in the world now. And they said in the 1990s, whenever we had a process problem, or in the late 80s or early 90s, whenever we had a process problem, they'd go rip somebody out of IBM. I bet you didn't know that. Okay, but they'd go rip somebody out of IBM. It's like, oh, well, we'll hire a returnee, give them a lot of money, have them come back to Taiwan and fix the problem. Right, so it's, I would argue a lot of this stuff that you see going on in China happened in uh, Taiwan and Korea in the 80s, uh, happened in Japan in the 50s and 60s. And in fact, if you go back and look at the archives, like for example, the Lowell Machine Group in the US where people were learning to make textile machinery by going back to the UK uh, and working in the factory, memorizing the design, coming back. A little more sophisticated today with CAD CAM tools it's a lot easier, right? When does imitation work? Are there challenges associated with that? First of all, I'd say it's a very hard way to learn, right? Uh, you don't have a lot of teachers, but you know, this whole learning process is, itself is significant. A significant thing that drives this is that there's a market for the output. Like Zhou Zhongshan told me, he said, well, you know, at the time they were doing this in China, there was such a market for small gasoline engines it didn't matter how good they were, right? Can I put gas in it, turn the starter, have the thing run for a while? You're smiling. You must understand this. Okay, you know, the sales manager is complaining to me. He says, like, you know, Chinese people, they don't change the oil in their motorcycle. When the motorcycle breaks, they buy a new motorcycle. 
you know, if it only costs you $800 for a motorcycle, how much are you going to invest in maintenance on that? So there's a lot of those things. But this market for the output, which finances, quote unquote, practice, allowing me to get better. Now, what's interesting about Zhou Zhongshan is, uh, I can't believe he signed off on this when we put it in the case. It's like, well, he got tired of having to bribe people to get the key parts. So this is an incentive to vertically integrate and learn how to build more, right? So these guys, today, Zhongshan builds everything except the shock absorbers and I think the taillights, which I don't understand why he doesn't build <laughs> taillights and uh, shock absorbers. Okay, but, you know, uh, they've learned a lot from this whole imitation re regime. The property rights regime being relatively weak in China for, you know, particularly the 80s, before 2000, starting to change more, but uh, having a weak property rights regime uh, really allowed them to appropriate some of the returns of this. Okay, so a lot of interesting aspects about this innovation stage. So then what I did is I started looking at this whole question of technological learning in <laughs> developing countries, which is kind of the broader question, all right? And it's, uh, you know, primarily conscious and very purposive uh, rather than kind of automatic, right? In other words, as I select activities that I'm going to engage in and choose those things, uh, the choice of those activities can have a heavy influence on what kind of capabilities I learn. Ultimate, uh, oops, sorry, ultimate global market position tends to be governed by the intensity of learning activities. So if you look at the thousand motorcycle companies in China, it's really shaking down to maybe a dozen or so, or maybe a few more than that. You know, there's kind of a path dependence, what people do and how they develop the capabilities. The learning itself had to be learned. You see this particularly in Korea, which is a very impressive story if you look at how they went from primarily an agrarian economy, or the same thing in Taiwan, which went from primarily agrarian economy to a high-tech powerhouse. Taiwan in the 1960s, the average firm size was 10 people. I mean, that's across all companies. That meant there were a lot of firms that were what they call household manufacturing, right? They, you know, they would make rubber sandals in their living room, right? But there weren't a lot of, a lot of firms. So how I transitioned from traditional technologies, which may not be a good base to master some of the new things, is really a very interesting question. For technology latecomers, uh, there can be benefits to this because, uh, in fact, uh, I can borrow a lot from others. Uh, in 2004, I had the wonderful opportunity to... 2004, there were 15 Gen 5 flat panel display factories that were built around the world in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. I had the privilege of vis visiting about eight or nine of them. Okay, and you could see this evolution from the first one to the last one, how much the later ones had learned from all the mistakes of the earlier ones. Usually that was conveyed by the tool manufacturers who said, well, we made that mistake in that first fab down in Taiwan. Let's not make that mistake in this new one in Beijing. All right, so uh, a lot of interesting aspects of that. So when know-how is embodied in tools, you can actually, if you're a latecomer, it can favor it can favor the latecomers. So two of the newest uh, Gen 5 fabs were, one was in Beijing, one was in Shanghai. Right? I visited both of those. The one in Shanghai clearly had a lot of those benefits that were learned from earlier on. Uh, it's all about developing processes and routines. Uh, you know, how do I maximize some function, but you know, how do I develop organizational routines in some of these learnings? What's interesting about this is... Uh, uh, Zhongshan, you know, they got very good at this kind of imitation phase. So they say, oh, we've got to invest in differentiation. So I go over to their design studio. They want to show me their design studio. I go into the design studio. I see all these clay models for new motorcycles and stuff, all these advanced CAD CAM tools. And then just a little off to the center of the lab is a brand new Yamaha motorcycle. It's like, hmm, can't get that copying out of your blood, right? I mean, they were very good at copying, and they're not so good at other types of innovations. Uh, capabilities are not necessarily transferred easily from one or another. Kind of the different technologies involved 
different breadth of skills, and sometimes you need different kinds of specialization. R&D, by and large, is needed for revision and absorption of new technologies. This is why you see a lot of the emerging company, economies investing in R&D, because it allows them to more intelligently absorb learnings from other groups. Right? So uh, if you kind of plot uh, the advancement of learning in companies, in these emerging companies, like a lot of them kind of stay at the know-how stage. I know how to assemble an engine. I really don't know how the thing works. I don't know why things are where they are. As they uh, invest more in R&D, they can move kind of above this minimum level of capabilities to realizing much higher value, right? So uh, it's not a substitute for indigenous capability in terms of uh, learning R&D and so on. I'm, I'm going to skip through here quickly. Uh, a few words about China, right? You see a rapidly evolving uh, IP system where the, the patent law system is developing very quickly. Uh, IP protection environment is improving, but very different based on the field that you're in. If you're in telecom, it's becoming quite sophisticated. If you're in areas that are of less interest in protecting because the government might say we still need to learn and still may need to get, get capabilities, like if you're making commercial jet engines right now, a uh, very different game than it is in telecom where they have players like Huawei and ZTE who they really need to protect. Uh, I'm going to skip all of that. So, uh, you know, just kind of backing up on the big picture here, uh, the next question I have is like, what will your China and what will your strategy be in China when it becomes the world's largest market? So going back to my opening comment about this aircraft engine maker, uh, China is destined to be one of the world's largest markets for commercial aircraft. All right, so now I'm faced with this. Government wants the technology. I've got to play in the market. Uh, how, do I, how do I play there? A right? couple observations. You know, I see a lot of stuff going on in terms of China, in terms of uh, this shift from the imitation phase to the uh, uh, to an innovation phase. One of the great stories was in the Wall Street Journal about how, you know, uh, Chinese consumers, they don't want to buy the counterfeits anymore. They want to buy the real things. Right? I was just talking to a European company that said, you know, they're a pharma company, and they said, well, you know, our stuff is just duplicated instantly when we go to China. They uh, actually make a biologic drug, which is basically a protein with a particular protein sequence. So their protein sequence was a particular sequence. They went to this conference where this Chinese company uh, presented a paper and said, well, we have an innovative new sequence, and rather than going from top to bottom, they went from bottom to top. And I said, well, actually, if you think about this type of issue, you know, now what you want to think about is, I told them, geez, maybe you ought to brand your vaccine because, you know, Chinese consumers are going to be much more conscious about getting the authentic piece about that. So in terms of thinking about what should multinationals do, I, I argue that you have to be in the market. Uh, you know, the economics of enforcement are very challenging. If you, if you want to, you know, most patent litigation in the world happens in the U.S. because we have a unique combination of uh, a strong property rights regime, uh, a legal system that fosters this type of contest, and uh, the world's largest market, all right? So what you see in China right now is an emerging world's largest market. Economics of enforcement right now uh, are challenging at best. That means if you go enforce in China, you will never get your cost of enforcement back. Property rights re regime is evolving. What I've had Chinese people tell me is that uh, you know their patent system, I, intellectual protection, intellectual property protection system, will look something that's uniquely Chinese. They say what we do is we renovate ideas from other markets. Uh, the example they always cite is Buddhism, right? Buddhism came from India, it was renovated in China, and then became a Chinese Buddhism. And they said the IPR system will probably look something like that. It'll probably look more like the European system uh, with a first-to-file 
uh, regime, which is where we're going to in the U.S., but it'll be a unique system that will be uniquely suited to China, right? It says, if I'm a multinational, therefore, what kinds of things do I have to do? Well, I have to, I have to be in the market, right? So there are some tricky balances, and I'm sure we will have ample time to discuss that in the Q&A. I have to think about balancing that. Uh, relationships and partners are very important uh, in terms of how you play this. Some of the IPR situations I've seen, who your partners are and what your relationships with senior officials in the government are really quite important. And then how do I think about modularizing my IP? So in this environment where I now understand one of their objectives is learning, uh, how am I going to modularize it so that I don't give one player kind of all the pieces of the gun, if you will? So I just wanted to kind of put that out there, and then we can let Tim make some comments, and then I'm sure we'll have a vigorous discussion afterwards. Okay? Right. Now, wh now, when Jesse told me that yesterday on the phone, I said, well, you don't even have to go to China for that, right? You know, they can hack into it yeah. here, right? Because yeah. uh, I have a friend who's on the board of Symantec, and he said, let me give you a report about where all the traffic is. But, you know, what, we've, what I would argue we've seen is technology has facilitated this reverse engineering and transfer of knowledge so that it's much easier than it used to be 100 years ago, right? So in some regards, it's more facile. All right. Still have to deal with it. Um, so the topic of China and the intellectual property laws is, in my opinion, a uh, context which asks the same question that everyone always asks about China, which is to say, is China destined in some way to follow the path of other countries? Is it going to eventually, in the intellectual property uh, era, uh, become like Europe, become like the United States, and embrace a strong intellectual property system? Or is the China in some way destined to go its own way? Is it going to find a different, in a long-standing way, a different uh, equilibrium for how it treats intellectual property? I think the assumption has been, uh, mostly in, in particular in the United States, that over time, China should be expected to follow the route that other wealthy countries have and eventually embrace intellectual property rights. But I'm not so sure about that. I think it's actually an open question. Um, I, I put this up here to kind of uh, pose the question. It is uh, 12 years after, um, or 11 years after China joined the, the WTO. 12 years. And um, here you have what looks uh, to everyone like an Apple store. And um, there's the iPhone 4. looks very nice. Uh, unfortunately, spelled store wrong. And that's because this is actually not an Apple store. <laughs> this is a fake Apple store um, that is, in fact, selling Apple products, but has nothing to do with the company Apple. And the thing that's so interesting about the store is that the employees don't even know it's not a real Apple store. Someone went there and interviewed the employees, and they say, yeah, we work for Apple. Well, why would they know? I mean, they just show up, and they say, we're Apple. Here, here's the store. Come, come and work for us. And not only is this uh, here, there are, there are uh, in fact, 22 such stores. It's sort of a mini chain, or I don't know if they're associated, but there's 22 uh, different fake Apple stores in China, at least that have been discovered uh, so far. So let me talk a little bit uh, with my context of whether China is going to, in fact, follow the West or not, let me speak a little bit about um, the history of uh, China and intellectual property, recent history, not, um, not Tang Dynasty stuff, <laughs> but uh, recent history. Um, there is a resemblance to the campaign of, the America, of American uh, intellectual property owners uh, and uh, against China or, or to try to get China to follow the laws, and Napoleon's effort to conquer Russia. 
That is to say that it always seems that the American manufacturers are winning, at least in the legal battle sense of the world. Most of the legal wars have been won by American or Western manufacturers. But in the long run, it's not clear, as, as some of your discussion has put forward, exactly where the, the balance uh, lies. Uh, we can be begin back in the 1990s when, when China first became a market economy. Uh, again, obviously market economy before um, communism. And uh, the idea back then in the 1990s is that, well, we need to get China to sign the major treaties. Once China signs the major intellectual property treaties, then, uh, th then uh, things will be fine because then they'll have to uh, uh, obey those laws. And um, this, this was in the context of the discussion of China joining the WTO. China agreed to join the WTO and, as you all know, passed all the laws necessary uh, for ascension to the WTO, which included a full set of intellectual property laws. Part of the WTO, World Training Organization System, are a, a series of treaties which requires every country to have a minimum level of intellectual property protection. China agreed that, so it seemed like uh, th this would be fine. And in fact, China set up the laws and set up the courts. Nonetheless, um, <laughs> for most of the 2000s, you can still, and as you were talking about, you can go uh, anywhere in Beijing and buying counterfeit goods uh, relatively easily. So there's been efforts to try to make China obey the laws it, it agreed to. There is an ongoing campaign by the United States Trade Representative Office uh, of, of attempting a sort of scolding China and uh, threatening various uh, forms of sanction. In 2007, the um, American Trade Office brought a case against China for failure to, uh, for certain uh, aspects of its intellectual property laws not being up to WTO standards, so they brought a dispute in the WTO, which um, the United States mostly won. It lost on a few issues. So that was, uh, I suppose, another success. But yet again, nothing at the point at which matters really seemed to change, at least for American companies. So we turn to the, the latest uh, efforts, and uh, these are a little bit more novel. The, the most recent efforts have been to say, well, we're not going to have any success at, in China itself. Then perhaps what we should try to do is to try to stop Chinese exports from reaching the United States if they were made or somehow involved in violations of intellectual property rights. Um, this has been a sort of an ongoing campaign. When I was in, in government last year, um, the, the kind of the, um, uh, the road show came to, to our agency. And um, the basic idea was this. The, the theory is that most Chinese manufacturers, as, as you were suggesting, or many Chinese manufacturers rely on intellectual property violations. And so therefore, the goods that they create should be considered count, count, contraband. So this is to say, you know, this... Um, Trying to think, maybe uh, maybe this device was, or this isn't a device. Maybe this was made in China, and maybe the uh, factory was made had a, a legal version of Microsoft Office and Word and uh, Microsoft uh, Windows and so forth. And so, therefore, the means of producing the good were illegitimate, and therefore, the United States should attempt to stop those kind of imports at the border. This is a kind of a novel strategy, as you can see. Because as opposed to trying to target copying itself, trying to go after either in China or somehow in the United States, the copiers themselves, it's tr the strategy is to try to seize the fruits of the copying or take aim at the fact that copying is lowering costs and therefore giving Chinese products uh, an advantage over American products. At least that's how the theory goes. Now there's some, I won't get into the, this is a, the, the law in this area is, is complicated and I, and I won't uh, say whether it is going to, uh, su this campaign is going to succeed or not, but that is the, I think the current uh, idea that I've seen that um, uh, might go forward. Now the disadvantage of that uh, system are, should be fairly obvious to American consumers. If it were successful, the price of it would result in a lot of Chinese products being stopped at the border, and everyone likes 
stuff that's cheap. Um, and there's obviously companies uh, like Walmart that would um, uh, find this very challenging. But I think you can see the idea behind the campaign. The idea, in some sense, is to try to put intellectual property violation and child labor in the same camp. Child labor or, or other, or slave labor, sort of certain types of things. To say, what we need to target, the theory goes, are illegitimate means of manufacturing, whether they involve human rights abuses, I should have said environmental abuses, or intellectual property violations, put that into that camp and, and try to make that target. So that's the, the latest effort. Let me return to my uh, question that I opened with, and I'm going to end uh, pretty soon so we have some time for questions, discussion. Which the question is whether or not, um, what the prospects are for enforcement and whether or not China will follow uh, the same path as the West has. One thing you, you notice from, from spending time in China or, or observing this, uh, this situation is the sort of old point that law professors know well, that law really is about remedies and, and enforcement. Um, and at some other level, uh, law can very much depend on what, at an almost retail level, people believe. And the challenge for intellectual property enforcement in China is, as to this point, I don't think that that many people in China, with the exception of perhaps some of the judges on the intellectual property courts, really believe in enforcing intellectual property is in their interest. And they've signed the laws, they've done all the stuff, but the sense that it's actually in the country's interest, or, or in the individual sense that there's something deeply wrong about violating intellectual property, I do not think exists. And it's very difficult, maybe an obvious point, but it's very difficult to have an effective legal regime without some backdrop of, of a normative commitment or of a sense by the government that it's actually in its interest to enforce this law. And until that happens, um, it seems unlikely that China will follow that path. Which leads me to the final question, which is, is, however, in some sense, China's maturation, China's coming to its senses, China's ultimate embrace of intellectual property inevitable? Well, the argument that it is is often based on the case of the United States, as many of you may know, and as uh, Willie definitely knows. Um, the great pirate nation of the 19th century was the United States. Uh, Charles um, Dickens came on a tour of the United States to complain about copyright infringement because um, everybody was stealing his work. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was sort of an uh, older version of Napster. For, I mean, he was a printer. He was a, uh, violated co uh, English intellectual property rights. At least, uh, not according. He didn't violate American law because it wasn't illegal to print English works. But the English uh, people were not happy with his activities. Maybe that's why he had the revolution. Anyway, um, the point is, uh, uh, the United States is often uh, said to be the template. Eventually, the United States decided that when it became an exporter of, of copyrighted goods, that intellectual property laws were deeply in its interest. But with China, I, I, I can see that happen, but I remain unsure that China will indeed follow the path of the United States. And I say that for a few uh, reasons. First, it's not completely clear in the digital age that the intellectual property laws are actually good for a country. I mean, I know that's sort of an article of faith among, among many people, but it's not completely clear that that's true. They were written in an era uh, that presumed copying was difficult and expensive. That was um, the underlying baseline. And, you know, where copying was either originally done by hand or by printing presses. And as everyone knows now, it's more hard not to copy stuff than to copy stuff. Everyone in this room copies things uh, copies things from the moment they have breakfast all the way through they forward emails to their, their friends. It's constantly happening. And intellectual property laws are constantly being, being uh, violated. So China, which is growing up or maturing in a different age, in some ways is testing whether the intellectual property laws actually do serve a country's interests in the digital environment. And don't have quite the answer to that, but that's what I think it will ultimately depend on. Thank you very much.